The shift register is the PLC's version of the children's party game, Pass the Parcel. To demonstrate, let's say we have a machine making product, an inspection sensor is connected to input one, and it switches high if a faulty product is detected. Another sensor detects each index of the machine when the product is advanced one position along the line. We're using the asynchronous pulse generator to simulate this by giving a pulse every second. Our production line has an ejector air jet six stations after the inspection sensor, and we want to blow the reject parts off when they arrive at that position. I've added a counter so we can keep track of the pulses from the simulated indexer. I'm showing all eight bits from the shift register for the demonstration, but in practice, we'd only need the sixth bit. For a fuller understanding of the shift register function block, see its own video on the link below. So we'll switch on the simulation and we can see our machine is indexing away here, five, six, seven, and we will now generate a reject by turning on the fault. We can see a reject has gone and is moving along the line. And when it gets to station six, the output turns on for the duration of the part being in there. If we hold on to generate two or three in a row, we can see that when we get to station six, the air jet will blow off all three defective parts. In version 8.3, we can have up to four shift registers. And when using a shift register bit, we have the option to select any bit that has not been used so far in the program. So you can see shift register 2.1 to 2.8 are available, 3.1 to 3.8 and 4.1 to 4.8. The digital signals status zero and status one are very simple to understand. Status zero gives a permanent low, status one gives a permanent high. If you run the simulator, this, the result is obvious. Now, there's not much point in wiring an output permanently high, but they do have their uses. For example, if we want a message text on all the time, the message text enable needs to be high for before it will display anything. And the status one will do that satisfactorily. We could also use the high signal to reverse a counter, for example, by just wiring it to the direction input. And in this case, the counter will always count down. Observe on the simulation that the default values for the input are shown by the colors on the simulator. So here we can see that reset, count and direction are all assumed to be low unless you deliberately wire them to a high or another function blocks output. Rather sensibly and conveniently, the basic functions of logic also assume sensible values for their inputs. Those are the eight basic functions for logic. And if we run the simulation on those, we can see that the inputs of an AND gate are assumed to be high, unless they're connected to the output of another function block. Inputs to OR gates are assumed to be low. The XOR assumes low and the NOT gate assumes high. So that can eliminate a lot of unnecessary wiring and keep your diagram clutter free. In ladder mode, they simply show up as a low contact and a high contact. The digital outputs are quite simple. Each can be used only once. They are assigned sequentially, but can be assigned to another unused number. There are four on the basic unit, but more can be added using expansion modules. Outputs are updated at the end of each cycle scan of the program logic, and this value is held until updated at the end of the next program scan. In hardware, the outputs are either relay type or transistor type. 
You can find more information on this in the hardware videos, but essentially, while the relays are of high quality and robust, they do have a limited number of switching cycles before mechanical wear causes them to fail. For high frequency switching, the transistor outputs will be more robust. The open connector can be used in situations where a function block requires a digital output, but you don't want to waste a marker or cause confusion in the program. An example of this is using the message text. It has a digital output, requires a connection to it. In the simulator, it will be fairly happy. Now, if we run the simulation, we can see that it's happy enough. But if we try to transfer it to the logo itself, we'll get a warning to say that there's an unterminated message text. We can fix that easily enough. by using the open connector output and simulation will work as normal. The flag or marker block just passes its input to its output. So if we wire up input and output Connect through, simulate, turn on the input, output turns on, turn off the input, output turns off. On the face of it, this has limited value, but we'll see there are some good reasons to use them. Depending on your model of logo, you could have up to 64 marker flags in them. Some of them have preordained purposes, such as M8, which is the initialization flag. It will fire once when the PLC is powered up. You could use that to reset various timers, count values, whatever. There are several here which control the logo display backlight. M25 will set the display background white. M28 will set it amber and M29 will set it red. For the logo TDE, the remote text display, M26 will set it white. M30 will set it amber and M30 D1 will set it red. There's also an M27, which is the message character set flag. So this will switch between the two character sets, which are covered elsewhere in another video. There's also one other special use we can set up in the properties of the project. We can set email events and we can set, say we choose M34, we want to send an email out. Email subject, well, let's set it to groups one and group three of our setup. Okay, that. And we'll see then that M34 has taken on a turquoise color indicating that it's an email transmission flag. So fairly handy. The other problem flags or markers can solve for is, is that of recursion. Recursion is where we take the output from somewhere along a chain of function blocks and try to feed it back to earlier in the same chain. Here I've got a simple setup where I toggle the input, sets the latching relay and runs the timer. Timer is timed out, the output is turned on, but I want that to reset the latching relay. If I try to connect them up, I get a recursion only allowed via outputs and flags warning. So that forces us to use either an output or a flag. So we'll demonstrate the output first, tidy up. And now we can connect the reset to there, clean that up, run the simulation, toggle the input. The latching relay is turned on, the timer times out feeds back and resets. Now this causes us to waste an output for something that's only internal, so we can use the flag instead. Connect up. Mm. 
run the simulation, toggle the input, sets the latching relay, the marker turns on and resets. So again, very handy and useful feature.